Hello, and a warm welcome to you. My name is Lester Hightower, and today I'm going to speak a little bit about precisely correcting low blood sugars. I'm also going to provide a recipe for shelf-stable liquid glucose that you can make at home. My connection to type 1 diabetes is my son, Andrew. He was diagnosed at the age of 5, and he's now 16 years old. I like to provide this slide at the start of these videos to show the journey that we've walked Andrew through with type 1 diabetes. The photographs show him uh, annually from age 5 to 15. He's now 16. And the A1C chart in the back sort of demonstrates the success we've had in his 11 years with type 1 diabetes following Dr. Bernstein's Diabetes Solutions Management Regimen. So to, to precisely correct low blood sugars, we use measured amounts of glucose to raise Andrew's blood sugar rapidly and precisely. The table in the middle of the slide is from chapter 20 of Dr. Bernstein's book, Diabetes Solution. Uh, it's just a starting point and individuals will vary. In fact, I circled in red sort of roughly where my son is in terms of body weight. He weighs just a little over 200 pounds now. And that says that uh, one gram of glucose should raise his blood sugar between 3.3 and 4 milligrams per deciliter. That's somewhat close, but actually not exactly right for my son. During the daylight hours, a gram of glucose will raise his blood sugar more like 7 milligrams per deciliter. And overnight, we only get about 3.5 to 4 milligrams per deciliter per gram of glucose. So this chart is a really good starting point, but individuals will have to figure out exactly how much a gram of glucose raises their blood sugar or their child's blood sugar. So we use only glucose to raise low blood sugars. We do not use food. And we do that for a very specific reason, and that's because glucose, which is also known as dextrose, is directly absorbed by the mucous membranes of the stomach and the gut. It's very important because it does not need to be digested or converted by the liver into anything else. And glucose can be very precisely dosed and you can get repeatable actions from using pure glucose. So at the bottom of this slide are pictured several types of glucose that we commonly use today or have commonly used in the past. Uh, the liquid glucose starts on the far left. We're going to talk about that a lot more in this presentation. Uh, we use Smarties a lot, particularly when Andrew was younger. The original small-sized American Smartie is 0 0.4 grams of pure glucose per little candy. We used those almost exclusively during the daytime in Andrew's uh, early years of diabetes when he was five, six, seven, eight, maybe even into nine years old. As he grew and got larger, we moved into giant Smarties, even used Mega Smarties for a while, which are three grams per candy. But in recent years, Andrew sort of settled into using either bottle caps and or, and or sweet tarts, uh, which I have pictured to the right. Those are both one gram of glucose per candy. Um, so glucose tablets or candies, let's talk about those for a second. So those are commercially available in the form of glucose tablets. And I have a Rely On brand pictured uh, to the left here. As I mentioned on the last slide, Andrew predominantly uses sweet tarts or bottle caps now. Uh, sweet tarts as an example, very, very similar to bottle caps are, uh, and you can see the nutrition facts there, 12 grams for 13 pieces, simple math. It's very near one gram of glucose per piece of candy. Uh, Andrew uses both sweet tarts uh, and bottle caps. My wife buys both, whatever's available, whatever's on sale. Uh, what's really important here is that you want products where the first and the predominant ingredient is dextrose or glucose. Uh, you want to avoid candy that has ingredients such as fructose, corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup, sugar, which is 50% fructose, et cetera, et cetera. So my son predominantly carries his sweet tarts and bottle caps in these little slide top tin containers that I purchased from Amazon. Each one of these little tins holds exactly 20 pieces of a sweet tart or a bottle uh, top candy. You actually can see in the largest photograph here, both sweet tarts and bottle caps in that tin. Uh, the smart uh, excuse me, the sweet tarts have words on them. I can read fierce and novice on a, a red and green candy. And then the bottle caps, of course, say bottle caps on them. 
Um, there'll be a link uh, in the uh, description of this video to these little tins. These are very convenient for Andrew. They hold exactly 20 candies. They fit very nicely in the bag that he carries around school. He also can slide one of these tins easily into the front pocket of, a, of his pants. Um, very, very convenient. Another thing we like about these is Andrew doesn't have to really think much about taking glucose. If he needs to take two or three, four or five uh, tablets of glucose during the day, he can just do that. At the end of the day, we can open the tins, count what's left, and understand exactly how many grams of glucose he took during that school day, which is really helpful in adjusting uh, insulin doses down uh, when we need to. So next we're gonna talk about liquid glucose. And in our experience, liquid glucose can raise blood sugars more rapidly than tabletized forms of glucose. We prefer to use liquid glucose at night because it is more rapid. It's also easier to administer. It does not require chewing and it does not leave sugar sitting on the teeth from chewing. Uh, for many years, we used the two ounce or 60 milliliter glucose bottles that are commonly available at retail, uh, typically at pharmacies. Those contain 15 grams of glucose per bottle. While those are very effective and convenient, they're expensive. And so we now make our own liquid glucose. Uh, our homemade version costs about 15 cent per two ounce bottle versus approximately $2 uh, at retail. It's a 92% cost savings. So these are examples of the commercial liquid glucose solutions that are available. There's many of them. Almost every pharmacy has their own brand. Each of these bottles is 60 milliliters of liquid and holds 15 grams of glucose. So you can see the math there. That's a concentration of 1.25 grams of glucose per teaspoon of liquid. So we precisely dose liquid glucose. And my son is now 16 years old. He's 6'3", over 200 pounds. So we most often use a one ounce shot glass, uh, a glass one, like his picture to the left there. And that can dose up to six teaspoons, which at a concentration of 1.2 grams per teaspoon is seven and a half grams of glucose per a full shot glass. Uh, in this photo are some other dosing options uh, that may be useful, particularly if you have a smaller child. The two options shown to the right uh, are um, uh, up to two milliliters, excuse me, two teaspoons, 10 milliliters, and can be used to sort of more precisely dose for a smaller child and or squirt uh, you know, liquid glucose into a child's mouth while they essentially are asleep. Um, those might be some nice options for smaller children. So we also occasionally use glucose gel, and I want to talk about it for just a minute. To my knowledge, glucose gels have the highest concentration of glucose, of anything that I'm aware of. Uh, the one pictured here is the one that I keep on hand, and it is 2.34 grams of glucose per teaspoon. The math is shown there in the middle of the slide. Um, we don't use these glucose gels often. I typically carry one uh, in my uh, coat pocket uh, when I go to Andrew's basketball games. He's never had a problem during a basketball game, but if he did, uh, I have that in my pocket. When we have used this is in a couple of situations where nausea was involved. Uh, we had a couple of situations where uh, uh, Andrew was vomiting, blood sugars were low, trying to use liquid glucose would stimulate vomiting and this glucose gel seemed to really help raise blood sugar and it was not nearly uh, as, as nauseous to him as uh, liquid glucose was. So we keep uh, several uh, tubes of this glucose gel on hand primarily for that reason. So I'm going to provide you with a recipe for the shelf stable liquid glucose that we make uh, in my family. The recipe that I use makes 750 milliliters of a 1.25 gram per teaspoon concentration that matches the concentration of the commercially available liquid glucoses that I showed earlier. To make this recipe, you'll need an accurate kitchen scale that can provide units of weight in grams, and you'll need these ingredients. You'll need powdered dextrose. You'll need 188 grams of that. Uh, you'll need nine grams of citric acid. You'll need a gram and a half, I round to two for this recipe. So two grams of calcium asorbate. You'll need water. You'll add up to the 750 milliliter line uh, in your uh, Pyrex uh, uh, container, which I'll show you in just a second. Uh, and then to that glucose solution, 
I add a little bit of orange extract, which gives it an orange flavor, and a little bit of food coloring, which gives it an orange color. So I'm going to walk you through step by step the process that I use to make this liquid glucose. So this slide shows the ingredients that you need. You'll see pictured in the left the powdered dextrose, the citric acid, and the calcium ascorbate, and the Pyrex uh, measuring uh, cup that I use, and the um, kitchen scale that I use. And to the right you'll see the uh, McCormick orange extract the McCormick food coloring, and a one quarter teaspoon uh, measuring cup that I use to, to measure the orange extract. So I start by carefully cleaning my target container. So we use a 750 milliliter glass bottle that began its life holding a sugar-free Tarani syrup. Uh, I strongly recommend that you use glass because we also use heat in this recipe. We do that both for sanitation and to dissolve the higher concentration of glucose that we want to dissolve into the water. Uh, I clean our bottle with white vinegar. I use about a half a cup, uh, close the bottle, shake it vigorously, and then let it sit uh, for a few minutes. Uh, I then rinse our bottle out during the five minute microwave step, which you'll see uh, in just a moment. So I start by putting the one quart Pyrex container on the scale and then zeroing it out. Um, and then I place 188 grams of dextrose powder into that Pyrex container. Once the dextrose powder is in, I add 9 grams of citric acid using a teaspoon and very slowly adding. And you'll see between the last slide and this slide that I raised the weight from 188 grams to 197 grams. And I did that by adding 9 grams of citric acid. And after the citric acid, I add two grams of calcium ascorbate, also using a teaspoon and being very careful and adding very slowly. So once I have those three powdered ingredients in, I add water to the 750 milliliter line of the Pyrex container. Now I don't typically weigh uh, the uh, Pyrex container at this step, but just for the purposes of making this video, I did weigh it. And just for your reference, uh, the water and powder together weighed 811 grams. So I stir vigorously at this stage, but in the cold water, you cannot dissolve that much glucose. So I stir it and then I microwave for approximately five minutes and the heating is required to dissolve this concentration of glucose powder. Um, after five minutes in my microwave, uh, the water gets to about 172 degrees Fahrenheit. That does a couple of things. Uh, most microorganisms can't survive at 170-ish or so degrees. Um, it also is warm enough to dissolve the liquid glucose. I typically don't use a handheld thermometer and, and do this measurement. I just I did it for the purpose of, this vid of, of making this presentation, making this video. But you may want to measure uh, your, uh, your water temperature the first time you do this. Your microwave may need six minutes. It may need four minutes. Um, I would not recommend heating all the way to the boiling. It would just slow your process down. But getting up in that 170, 180 degree range is probably smart from a microorganism's perspective. It also lets the glucose dissolve. Um, at this step, I also add a little bit of food coloring, um, a few drops of yellow, a couple drops of red, and that gives me a nice orange color and when you stir uh, the glucose and the food coloring uh, together um, and the flavoring uh, this is what it looks like and I transfer it uh, with a funnel uh, into the 750 milliliter uh, Tarani bottle that I mentioned earlier. So that's the step-by-step -step procedure that I use to make the liquid glucose. Um, if you have a smaller child and would like to make smaller batches this slide shows how to make a 500 milliliter version uh, of liquid glucose, and I made 500 milliliters uh, for several, uh, well, maybe for several months, couple years. Um, but as time went on, I became increasingly confident in the shelf stability of 750 milliliters. I've been making that most recently. But uh, if you'll just follow the steps I provided earlier using uh, these amounts of ingredients, then you can make a smaller batch, a 500 milliliter batch.
So I'd like to acknowledge the fact that the original recipe uh, for liquid glucose that I used came from Dr. Artie Deitman and it came from Dr. Bernstein. Uh, that recipe was for a concentration of one gram of glucose per teaspoon and it used only citric acid. So in my Florida home, that recipe would start to grow things within two to three weeks. I would get, you know, I'm not sure if it was bacterial or fungal growth, but things would start to grow uh, inside of that concentration. So it was not shelf stable. Uh, Ms. Michelle Thayer and I uh, collaborated for a few months, a couple years ago, to try to improve on the recipe. And our collaboration led to this recipe, which is one and a quarter teaspoon concentration, um, which matches the commercial concentrations and we added uh, calcium sorbate uh, to the recipe. Um, with this recipe, which I've now been using for quite a long time, I've not seen any microorganisms grow in my Florida home, and I do not refrigerate uh, this recipe. Um, now my wife and I do transfer from the 750 milliliter bottle into small 60 milliliter bottles that originally held commercial liquid glucose. And so we don't open the 750 milliliter bottle very often or very frequently, but it is not refrigerated and it is not grown things. Uh, you know, being in my uh, Florida home for many, 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 many weeks at the time. So I'll close with a pro tip. So instead of wasting the vinegar that you use to clean out your uh, bottle for your liquid glucose, pour it down your home's HVAC uh, condensation drain line. Uh, I live in Florida. Uh, this is a maintenance item that we really need to do, or we will have these uh, condensation lines clog up, primarily because fungus grows uh, on the end of them on the outside of the houses. And uh, I make this recipe uh, every few weeks uh, to keep our home stocked with uh, liquid glucose for my son. And by taking advantage of pouring that vinegar, uh, that leftover vinegar down my HVAC condensate line, I never have a problem with uh, clogged condensation lines. So that's the end of this talk. I sincerely hope that it was helpful to you, and thank you very much for listening.